Hello and welcome to another episode of Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie. I'm the titular Sean. And I'm the very titular Carrie. And this is a show that gives you a look into the unexplainable, the unbelievable, the macabre, and the bizarre, and tries to find an answer. This week, Carrie, it's going to be a lot of the macabre and a lot of the unbelievable as we look at deaths in magic. Ooh, some of my favorite things. Yeah, uh, so what I wanted to focus on was fatal accidents during magic shows, I guess, but... So this isn't like uh, some Aleister Crowley kind of magic. This is performative magic. Yes, but I but I would argue that they all come from a similar place, uh, Carrie, and certainly we'll cover, hopefully we'll cover Mr. Crowley at some point on this... Mr. Mr. Crowley! Mr. Crowley! At some point on this podcast, but um, suffice it to say, he was pretty performative. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say that the common place it came from was bullshit. So, um, you know, it's different for you. Yeah, well, that's potentially related, right? <laughs> but I think magic has a lot to... Well, you know what really got me into this uh, kind of sidetrack was our Bridgeport Poltergeist episode, actually. Because William J. Hall, the author of the source book for that series... Um, the World's Most Haunted House. Thank you. The World's Most Haunted House uh, is himself a magician. Mm -hmm. And I talked in that episode, you'll remember, and our dear listeners will remember, uh, about how this is kind of a tradition for magicians. Um, a magician tradition. A magician tradition. You've got your James Randi, the amazing Randi. You've got your Penn and Teller going back to Houdini. And maybe, we'll find out in this episode, even before that, magicians, professional stage magicians, really like um, investigating and usually really like debunking paranormal phenomenon. Yeah, it's very interesting um, because they themselves are kind of bullshit artists, right? But in a way that they're... Basically saying that to the audience, um, you know, they're not claiming that this is real magic that they've pulled from the depths of hell or whatever. And I feel like they get kind of affronted and offended when people do claim those sorts of things. Yeah, I think so. I think we'll, uh, I will have a few words about Harry Houdini, who didn't die during a performance, um, but I will talk about him a little later in the show. And... I think that was kind of his thing. Like, listen, guys, I'm telling the audience that I'm lying to them, and it's still amazing. Um, what you're doing is just taking advantage uh, of gu gullible people. Well, he came up during the times of spiritualism, which um, I'm definitely going to do an episode on at some point. But basically, that was the fad of Ouija boards and spirit photography and psychics. It was a big thing in the 20s? Uh, earlier, turn of the century, to about the 20s, yeah. Mm -hmm. But we will... um. We will get to that in the second half of this podcast, so I don't want to spoil anything. Ooh, no spoilers. But we'll draw on your extensive uh, knowledge when we get to Mr. Houdini. Awesome. I want to give you a little bit of the history of magic first. Please. Starting with the word magic, because of course that can mean like... Oh, we're going way back, aren't yeah, we? Yeah, that, that can mean like stage illusions, or it can mean, you know, magic, like the thing that I don't think is real. Right, like the right-hand path, left-hand path, or... Wicca or whatever. Or, or the Tooth Fairy or Harry Potter. like any, any I think of, it's different. But those things are all magic, right? Anything that kind of can't be explained. Well, you know what? It You don't believe in anything. So I think it's a blanket thing that, you know, it's perfectly fair. I do believe in magic in, in the terms of like manifesting, where you, you kind of put out an energy into the universe and it comes back to you. Um, that's kind of part of my own beliefs, but, you know, not everyone feels the same way. Though I think a lot of faith in, in general involves magic in, in a weird way. Uh, it's just been changed to, you know, Catholicism and, and things like that, you know. Well, it's so funny that you mention that because the word magic actually comes from when the ancient Greeks were fighting the ancient Persians. Uh, the ancient Persians had these priests who would uh, supposedly do all these amazing Mm -hmm. uh, things. They could do all these supernatural things that made the Greeks very scared of them, or was supposed to make the Greeks very scared of them. And uh, those priests were called magosh. Like, oh my gosh. And so the Greek word for magic was magoi. Okay. Or magoi. Not sure. M-A-G-O-I, though. Mm -hmm. And that's where we get the word magic from today. So even back then, illusions were being used to fool the gullible into believing that people had uh, scary supernatural powers. 
for sure. And I think a lot of pagan rituals were, I mean, not, I don't think this, this is true. A lot of pagan rituals were adapted into um, what we know today as, as Christian or a different kind of faith based beliefs. Like Yule became uh, Christmas time and now you consume wine and bread and it's the actual body and blood of Jesus Christ. Like that's a magical ritual. That's, that's some crazy stuff. It, it is. And if you've ever been to a Catholic mass, it's, it's all, a, it's all a lot a of showmanship. Yeah. Too. It's, um... You have to wear your certain outfit. You have to light your certain candle. I mean, and there's a lot y'all of... are doing magic. I don't like, I don't want you to, to freak out, but you're doing magic. And... There's an altar. And there's a lot of, and yet, there's a lot of um, drawing the audience's attention to where it kind of needs to be. You know, they have uh, very effective ways of doing that, just like a magician would. Um, and yet, throughout history, the church has had trouble with people who claim to have supernatural powers, hasn't it? Well, if you have more powers than they do, that seems to be an issue. Yeah. And uh, that's kind of funny, because the first actual book of, like, explaining how to do magic tricks we have, the first magic book, if you will, um, was actually a book from 1584 called The Discovery of Witchcraft. Oh. And it was self-published by this guy named Reginald Scott, who just wanted people to stop burning witches. <laughs> and so he wrote a book all about, hey, I don't think witchcraft is real, you guys. Like, You're this is how you can make something disappear in your hand, and it's not of the devil, you just hide it behind your, you know sleeve or something yeah he had a chapter of like see your uncle didn't really make your nose disappear don't <laughs> i don't know i've never found my nose since and he had a drawing in it like you know look it's just tucked behind Stop. his other finger. really no not that trick oh i was gonna say that's that's classic that's old school i guess but it was like no it was like magic tricks it was like here's how people will make it look like they've cut their head off but then the head will talk to you from inside of a bucket yeah like it sounds like a fun magic trick right but uh, if, the, if someone was doing it in the wrong public square, um, they maybe they would be hanged as a witch if the wrong person saw it. So this book came out in the 1500s? Yeah. So we were still killing witches after that. So what went wrong there? Well, maybe people just really like to burn people or maybe... Or hang. Or maybe they weren't well read enough. I don't know. But um, this was the first ever instance of... Uh, of yeah, a book that told how to do magic tricks. And and it kind of set a pattern where all of the books we have from the 16 and 1700s that show how magic tricks are done are really, they're not written for magicians. They're not written to teach you how to do the trick where you cut your head off and then it talks to someone from inside a bucket. It's to show you how it's done and that a person's head isn't really being cut off. You know, like a um, exposing a fraud kind of thing more than a handbook or something. Well, the interesting thing is, and I'm definitely going to talk about this whenever I do a witchcraft in a Salem episode for sure, is that magic and paganism, you know, in the sense of the occult was really the realm of women. Um, it was a, it's a ma maternal woman based type of thing. It's all about the divine woman and when the church came along, they were like, mm, we're not about that. So they they turned all of those beliefs into church beliefs, which is, of course, a patriarchal thing. But if you're looking at famous magicians, the kinds that are doing these sleight of hand tricks or whatever, they're mostly men. So they're getting away with it. Well, so I think that's very interesting. Well, the kind of female practices you're talking about, I, I assume we're talking about more like home-based kind of remedy magic and that kind of thing? Well, folk it, changed, magic? it changed from the actual occult magic to the wink, wink, nudge, nudge, let me do a trick for you magic, but it changed from women to men. And I just think that's that's a very interesting point to be had, is that it became okay when A, you're admitting that it's bullshit, and B, you're a guy. Because, again, even in spiritualism, that had a lot of women um, doing the seances and things like that. And they were called out very quickly when they were, you know, yeah. lying to people and stuff. Yeah, by Harry Houdini. We'll get right. to it. <laughs> but I do think that's kind of a different thing. That, that to me, is more like... I don't know, folk magic practice that's happened throughout history. I, I, I don't think I'm it's actually... I'm just talking about what, what is okay in terms of 
people viewing magic. Because I think if it, again, like you said, if it's someone who's telling you this is real and I'm doing this for real, uh, it hits different. So I think it's okay if you're telling them it's not real. And it's also much preferable uh, to be a guy in doing this. Because like you said, all the people that you named before are uh, famous male magicians. I don't know many, if any, uh, famous female magicians, even now. No, you can see some great ones on Penn and Teller Fool Us, but uh, not as many as you'd think. Mm -hmm. I would suspect that now, that's probably a, it's probably a thing that's changing, but slowly, because magic is just such a... It's so nerdy in that it's a thing that you have to practice and spend a lot of a lot of serious time with to get good at doing something objectively silly. Mm -hmm. So I don't think, and that's you know the best guitarists in the world, the best um, uh, banjo players, the best uh, uh, magicians, uh, the, the people who are who have dedicated themselves the most to doing the stupidest things uh, seem to be men a lot of the time. <laughs> Interesting how that works out. Yeah, so I don't know. Nobody was really dedicating themselves to the craft of magic in that way, though. Mm -hmm. Through the 16 and 1700s, what you had were street charlatans kind of doing, with, oh, make a, make a coin appear for you, sir. Maybe another from, from me pocket. Um, mm -hmm. Just getting by kind of thing. That all changed with a guy named, and this is a French name that I'm going to try not to butcher, because he's a very famous, uh, important guy. Jean-Eugène Robert Houdin. Okay. Uh, Robert Houdin is uh, known as the father of modern kind of stage magic. And he was an apprentice clockmaker who, uh, in the 1800s, early, mid-1800s, who learned uh, magic from books. But again, books that were kind of like, expo here's how this fraud did this thing. Mm -hmm. And what he wanted was books that would tell him how he could do tricks and tell him how he could invent new tricks. Mm -hmm. And those didn't exist, so he had to kind of do the work from scratch he found like an old amateur magician to apprentice him and kind of teach him the ropes, teach him some tricks, and he took it from there and uh, really laid the foundations for what stage magic is today. He opened his own theater eventually, became talented enough and well-known enough to do that, a 200-seat theater in Paris in 1845, uh, the first theater dedicated to magic that I know of. And uh, at that theater, he would do illusions like levitating his son on stage. Uh, he would bring out a bare orange tree and cause flowers and oranges to bloom on it before the audience's eyes. Oh, that's just like in The Illusionist. You, he actually makes the whole tree grow. Uh, but yes, yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's oh, like I didn't a, know that was based on like a vaguely based on a real thing. But that's if anyone's seen that movie, that's definitely the aesthetic we're talking about, too, with these 1800s and early 90s. All the magicians we're talking about today. Uh, really Smoky, oil, lamp lit theaters, people quiet, just watching one little thing happen on the stage. Everyone in the crowd is in a, a tuxedo or like a hoop dress. Mm -hmm. And yeah, elaborate sets and really kind of uh, beautiful illusions that tell a story are definitely a, a theme, a running theme. And he would also uh, bring out a portfolio on stage, like a folder you would keep art in and stuff. He would uh, put that on a little table and then keep producing larger and larger items. <laughs> uh out of it, including a birdcage, and finally his son, who he had levitated before he pulled that kid out. <laughs> um, so that's cool. And he eventually toured Europe doing his act. Uh, it became worldwide famous. And even in 1856, the president of France sent Robert Houdin to French Algeria, where the natives were causing some trouble, uh, because he wanted him to pacify them with magic. So that's kind of like uh, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. It is... Uh, yeah, he was going to fight the original Napoleon for the English. But Similar vibes. Yeah, although here's how Robert Houdin was supposed to do his mission. There was a group of religious leaders called the Marabouts who were causing some, or Marabouts, who were causing some trouble, rabble-rousing amongst the locals and organizing against the French. And they would do these kind of little miracles to, to get people on their side. And so they sent Robert Houdin to do performances like three times a week for the Algerians, for the tribes. And, and they would come, so people, word spreads, bigger and bigger crowds come. And at the end of every performance, he would just go, and this is all fake. And he would show them how mm. uh, he did everything. So they had the idea that, you know, that that could be done. And then they stopped listening to these uh, 
religious leaders, and um, they, they were like, all right, the French are, French are okay, and Robert Houdon was uh, mission accomplished. Wow. So that's that's the guy. He, he died in 1871, but before he did, he um, really m- turned what was kind of street performance and a bunch of different traditions and pulled it all together into uh, what you'd recognize as magic today. Kind of cool. Very cool. Now, by the turn of the century, one of the... This is the 1900s. Yes. By, by 1900 or so, one of the most popular performers on vaudeville was an illusionist doing exactly this kind of magic. And he had kind of a different flavor. A Far Eastern flavor. Oh, boy. This famous magician was Chung Ling Su. Mm-hmm. He claimed to be American-born, the son of a Scotch missionary and a Cantonese woman, but both his parents allegedly died before he was 13, and he was taken in by a Chinese magician named R. He, who took him under his wing and taught him ancient mystical secrets. And now Chung Ling Su was touring the U.S., Europe, and the world, bringing those ancient secrets to audiences. Okay. He was a mysterious man because he didn't speak any English, allegedly. Was never heard to speak on stage and would only talk to the press through interpreters. Uh, Okay. And he was perhaps best known for his bullet catch trick. Now, he wasn't the only one doing a bullet catch. That's a pretty famous... You're familiar with the bullet catch magic trick? Familiar with it. I don't know how it works at all, but I'm familiar with it. I assume it has something to do with blanks and... Yeah, for, for those who, who don't know, it's kind of what it sounds like, right? The uh, magician takes a gun, takes a bullet, usually signed by a member of the audience, loads the bullet into the gun and has his assistant or someone else fire the gun at him, uh, appear to fire the gun at him, after which he appears to catch the bullet uh, in his hand or sometimes between his teeth or whatever mm-hmm. other silly flourish you want to do. Uh, David Blaine makes it, quote, believable by putting a metal cup in his mouth and catching the bullet there. <laughs> you know, uh, so you can dress it up however you want. But I don't so basically want- he somehow hides it when he's, quote unquote, loading the gun. And then someone fires a blank and he pops it out somehow. Yeah, well, we'll talk about how he specifically did the trick. I will reveal secrets in this episode, but not just yet. Uh, first, I want to take you back to Chung Ling Su's kind of origin story. When he was born in Westchester County in 1861 as William Ellsworth Robinson. Oh. To two Scottish parents. Uh Uh-oh. His father was James Campbell Robinson, a minstrel performer. Oh, dear. So it runs in the family. Yeah, his father specialized in uh, dialect singing, which is impersonating a black person's voice in a cartoonish way while wearing blackface. It was a different time. It wasn't okay then, but it was a different time. As well as hypnotism, ventriloquism, and magic tricks. And so he taught young Billy some of the tricks of the trade. So just, just dialing in on this, he was not half Cantonese. No, he certainly was not. Oh, boy. Okay. And it took him a while to find the Chung Ling Su gimmick. Uh, He started out as Robinson, the man of mystery, at age 14. And uh, shortly after he started working, he was like, I love this stuff. He went to vaudeville. Mm -hmm. And he did pretty well. He's a pretty talented magician. But Robinson, the man of mystery, was just never a headliner. And so he kept trying, trying to switch gimmicks and find something that worked. In 1887, he was doing, quote, black art illusions. Oh. Which are, don't, it's, that's not as minstrelly as it sounds, <laughs> Okay, I was just making sure. Wasn't doing his dad's old tricks, no. Uh, black art illusions, I had to look this up too, are when the whole stage is kind of um, dressed in black silk, and that enables a lot of the illusions to involve assistants dressed in black that the audience can't see, like handing things to the magician. So it's more of an optical illusion kind of thing. Yeah, but magic always is. Mm-hmm. This is just one way that it was being done at the time. Um he did these black art illusions under the name Ahmed Ben Ali. Um, the interesting Just pick a different white guy name than Robinson. The That's in- all. The interesting thing about that is this pretty famous magician named Max Ossinger was also doing a very similar act at that time and was going under the name Ben Ali Bay. Okay. So it's pretty likely 
that our friend Robinson just ripped him off completely. And uh, since Ozinger wasn't touring the U.S. at the time, he probably never found out and it didn't matter. Oh, boy. All right. So he still wasn't a headliner. And in 1896, he saw another opportunity to make a name for himself. There was this very famous Chinese magician who had come to town uh, by the name of Ching Ling Fu. Oh, no. Yep. So he just goes, Chung Ling Su, Ching Ling Fu, well, whatever. Well, hold on. Ching Ling Fu came to town and... Was he actually Asian? Yes, he was from okay, China. Okay, well, at least, at least there's that. And he was doing what was a pretty, pretty um, common gimmick at the time, pretty common promotional gag. Uh, he was offering $1,000 to anyone who could duplicate his illusions. And Robinson had seen Ching Ling Fu's act, and he was pretty sure he'd clocked a few things. So he was pretty sure he could win this bet. But he was never able to get Ching Ling Fu to take his calls, because Ching Ling Fu had no intention of paying that money out sure. to anyone. Mm -hmm. and so, so he took his name. Robinson was enraged. And by 1900, he had resurfaced under the name Chung Ling Su. Oh my god. By all accounts, doing mostly Ching Ling Fu's act. He <laughs> shaved the sides in the front of his hair and grew a long braid. Ugh. And he would wear grease paint on his face to darken his complexion. Yikes. And, and uh, uh, squint his eyes back. Like, really rough. Oh, no. And like I said, he never spoke on stage to give the illusion that he was a not an English speaker. And his signature illusion, the big thing that he did add to Ching Ling Fu's act, was this elaborate bullet catch that he called condemned to death by the boxers uh, and in his bullet catch there were two guns and two bullets both signed by separate members of the audience uh, they were fired from muskets hmm. at chung ling su i get the two the real name and the fake name <laughs> confused at chung ling su okay and um how would how would he catch him like two different hands I don't know if it was one hand or two. He would catch the two bullets. Mm -hmm. So he was making more money than Ching Ling Fu ever did with this act. Sure. He was an actual white guy. And this, and although, but no one knew. The, the illusion of his race was studiously kept from the public. And people actually believed this was a, a somehow had forgotten the guy with a similar his name. His privilege was so strong that it was so subconscious that he made more money. It's like, yeah, no, this, something about him seems more trustworthy to me. Oh, jeez. Um, so in 1905, Fu was understandably mad at Sue, a.k.a. Robinson. And one night when they were both in London, Robinson, a.k.a. Sue, booked at the Hippodrome and singling Fu at the nearby Empire Theater, Fu promised to reproduce, quote, at least half of the so-called Chung Ling Sue's tricks. And he said, I can do them because he stole them all from me. I'm the original Chinese conjurer. I mean, he's not wrong. That's true. And, and he's actually Chinese, so that helps. Yeah. And Su accepted. And so Fu was ready to spring his trap. He called the media. He called all the newspapers and said, all right, we're going to meet for this magic duel. <laughs> but what you guys got to know is this guy's actually white. And he basically stole my name. I know this guy. His name's Robinson. He's not even Chinese. So he knew. He, he knew that he was He white. remembered him. He remembered when he tried to collect on the bet. Mm. Here's the thing. None of the papers cared that he was a white guy. So they were like, okay. And there was so little interest that Fu actually backed out from the challenge. Oh, boy. And Sue was able to just keep on keeping on. Okay. He continued on as one of the highest paid headliners in vaudeville, really. Until 1918, doing the same act, the bullet catch and all. Uh, did I mention the bu his bullet catch was called Condemned to Death by the Boxers? The, yeah. The two assistants were also dressed like boxers, you know, the guys who uh, caused the rebellion in China in 1901. Mm -hmm. So let me tell you how he did this trick. Here's where we will, I'm sorry, re reveal some secrets. Yay. When a magician does a bullet catch, they're never catching a bullet. No. <laughs> Obviously. Um, the bullet's... Generally not fired from the gun. A blank is usually fired, and at some point the bullet has already been palmed by the magician to be revealed or wherever. Or stuck under his tongue or wherever it has to go. Exactly. 
one of the most sensational parts of this bullet trick was that these were breech loading muskets, uh, old timey. So the audience member would sign the bullet and put it right into the barrel. They would put it in. Okay. As soon as it was signed. Interesting. So it must have been much harder for him to get that palm it somehow. Right. And what would happen is the palm would happen later after the gunshot because these muskets secretly had two barrels, one under the first, mm -hmm. with only one attached to a trigger, and that barrel was always loaded with blanks. But how would he get it from the musket? Well, after that, the assistant can get that thing out of the musket. He can get it to Chung Ling Su at some point. I've never seen this trick. I don't know um, how exactly he, he then would get the bullet. Mm -hmm. What I do know is that the barrel that the bullet was loaded into was never supposed to be fired. The second barrel had a blank in it. That's the only one connected to a trigger. But the problem is apparently Chung Ling Su wasn't all that fastidious about cleaning and taking care of his equipment. Uh-oh. And when you have a double barrel like that, what you get is a lot of gunpowder that kind of builds up residue around not just the barrel being fired, but also the one right next to it. Mm -hmm. And so eventually, enough residue had built up that one night, when one of those assistants fired his musket, the blank ignited, ignited the second barrel, and fired that bullet. The right, real bullet. Real bullet, right into the very surprised... Chung Ling Su. Mm -mm. The audience was presumably very surprised to hear him say, in perfect English, Oh my god! <laughs> Something's happened! Lower the curtain! Uh-oh. So it's just shock after shock at that point. And that is how Chung Ling Su died. Oh, oh wow. Okay. Well, what ha the curtain lowered, and then what happened? I, I, I believe he was literally dead shortly after, like DOA at the hospital. He'd been shot in the, in the belly. Sure. I just didn't know if there was any. <laughs> wow. Okay. And the public was shocked by the revelation that this was a um, white man. And he died in front of you. But I love the idea. <laughs> like, he's, he's very carefully manicured this illusion and then just <laughs> if almost a Frasier style, like, oh, good God. <laughs> Yeah, the, the curtain goes down, the audience is quiet, and then all of a sudden, he was white? <laughs> <laughs> they were. They were shocked. Shocked that he could speak English. Oh, boy. So that was Chung Ling Su. Uh, it probably won't surprise you that he's not the only person ever to die doing a bullet catch. <laughs> it does not surprise me. Because, well, the bullet catch is never supposed to involve a real bullet being fired. Things can go wrong and guns are dangerous. Well, that's um pretty close to how Brandon Lee died on the set of The Crow, was that they were firing blanks, but there was like a piece of something left in the gun. Wadding, and, I think. Yeah, and that's what hit him, and it hit him with enough force of the force of a bullet that it was it acted basically like a bullet and killed him. Yeah. So don't use blank guns, kids. Just don't do it. In 1840, there was a magician named uh, Arnold Buck. And remember, this is still in the kind of old-timey... He's not in a cool theater or anything. He's probably on a wooden stage somewhere. I'd like just out in, in a grass field. And Arnold Buck apparently let a spectator load and fire the bullet. That was how he made his bullet catch trick special. Wow. And the bullet that the spectator was loading, unbeknownst to them, was a blank, right? Mm -hmm. But what if they slipped something else in? This one audience member thought he would have some fun and ruin this trick and show the show this magician for the fraud he was by loading a nail into the gun as well. Yeah, th but the way you ruin that trick is by shooting a guy with a nail. Which is what he did, and Arnold Buck died on the spot. Christ. There was also a husband and wife team that was uh, caught in the act with this trick. <laughs> oh, Yeah. Uh, Madame Delinsky was part of a Polish husband and wife duo. They took the bullet catch trick to truly excessive levels by using six soldiers who loaded their muskets in front of the crowd and in unison fired at the couple. Like a firing squad. Yeah. And the problem was just one, the, the gimmick was the soldiers were all just using blanks. Right. That's it. But one day one guy just forgot. And his soldier instincts kicked in. It's the thing he's done a thousand times. He just loaded a ball. 
and shot Madame Delinsky in the belly. She died two days later. Lee. She was pregnant, too. So oh, Sean. That one was a twofer. Sean! Hmm. Ugh. Horrible. So bullet catches are dangerous. Yeah. Even if they are blanks. Yeah. What, what do you think of Chung Ling Su? Ugh. I don't want to say he deserved it, but um, racism aside, you got to be pretty fastidious with cleaning your stuff if it's your life on the line. I can't emphasize enough. He was like a big act. He was like an earner at the time. Oh, I believe it. And we'll have more on what happens when illusions go horribly wrong after the break. You're here, which means you love podcasts, but are you looking for another kind of entertainment on the go? Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment and audiobooks, ranging from bestsellers to memoirs, news, business, and more. By signing up for a free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash ain't it scary, you'll receive access to thousands of titles with one credit toward any audiobook and two Audible originals, free during your trial and then with subscription each month after. Personally, my favorite Audible title is also my favorite book, It by Stephen King. I went into this audiobook ready to judge because I've loved this novel since I was a kid, but between the stellar production value and the truly breathtaking narration performance by actor Steven Weber, I was 100% all in. If you like this podcast, and have a strong stomach, I think you will be too. Not into audiobooks? No problem. With podcasts, theatrical performances, guided meditations, and more, Audible offers something for everyone. So what are you waiting for? Get started now. And hey, you'll be helping support the podcast. Visit our link at www.audibletrial.com slash ain't it scary for a free trial. That's www.audibletrial.com slash A-I-N-T-I-T-S-C-A-R-Y. Audible. Listen more. We talked about Chung Ling Su's condemned to death by the boxers. And it was it was just a bullet catch, right? But it was bigger. It was his twist on it. But it was also like an elaborate elaborate costumes, elaborate sets. That's what kind of the style of the time was. These people these magic shows were being done in theaters and people wanted to be uh, transported. And so often tricks had like a narrative a narrative to them, you know, a story. Um, and sometimes you'll see that still. I love when magic tricks do that. Uh, but it's not the, that's not how it's always done. And it's certainly not always done in a top hat and tails and uh, all that stuff. Again, like Edward Norton and The Illusionist. And that is exactly what I think of when I think of this next guy. Mm -hmm. Because here's a guy who liked an elaborate illusion. And of course, I'm talking about Sigmund Neuberger, a.k.a. The Great Lafayette. Of course you are. He was born in Munich in 1871. He was an immigrant, and his family came to the U.S. pretty early in life. And uh, he took to performing and ended up going out west to learn his trade. That's where you would, in the 1800s, do, if you were any kind of a, kind of a, a, a working musician, if you were a con man, or if you were a showman, you know, mm -hmm. it was good to go out west and hit mining camps and things where people would maybe pay a little bit for some entertainment. At this time, he perfected a shooting act with bows and arrows. He was a sharpshooter. Uh, he later developed quick change acts to, to add into that, along with more sharpshooting acts. And he started doing impressions, like celebrity impressions. Mm. But as he started making a name for himself, making a little money, and moving back east, he got really into performing elaborate set pieces. When I say elaborate set pieces, I mean he, he had one called The Coronation of Edward VII where Neuberger would quick change through all of the principles in the scene, including turning into the Archbishop of Canterbury at the end with a big stupid hat on. So by quick change, you mean that the uh, the fun bit here is that he's changing costume really quickly? Yes. Curtain goes up, curtain comes down, and he's in a new outfit. How did he do it? Mm -hmm. They're really, a, a good quick change act is really cool. Oh, for sure. As someone who has had to quick change before <laughs> backstage, it's not fun nor easy. <laughs> he had another one called The Sculptor's Dream, 
where a statue of Leda and the Swan, you know, that scene from Greek mythology. Uh, it's she, where, where she bangs the swan. Yeah, it's where Zeus bangs the lady. As, as a, a swan. swan. <laughs> yeah. Well, Newberger would bring out a statue of Leda and the Swan onto the stage, and then it would come to life. Be an and then she'd swan bang woman. a swan? She wouldn't bang the swan. It didn't <laughs> turn into like a donkey show. Oh, yuck. And his illusions generally... So you get the idea. He loved a story, he loved a big illusion, and he had tricks involving horses, dogs, and even a lion that he traveled around with on tour. Mm-hmm. So by 1900, this guy truly was the great Lafayette, because his shows in Europe and around the world were earning him 44,000 pounds a year, which in today money is $3.5 million. Damn. Just doing his silly little tricks. He had a big expensive manor house in London, as well as two luxury rail cars he would live in when he was in the US. One of those was for him, and one was for all the animals. And were they attached to a train? He would attach them to whatever locomotive he needed to 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 get where he had to go. Interesting. He was known to be super reserved, though. He didn't have a lot of friends in the magic world. And really anywhere. Except for Harry Houdini. Harry Houdini was also an immigrant. He was coming up around the same time. Uh, He was from Hungary, originally. And so they became good friends. And in fact, Harry Houdini, right when, right around when he was hitting it big, gifted Newberger with a white terrier named Beauty in 1899. A puppy? A puppy. Oh. And the puppy became Newberger's best friend and most prized possession. Yeah, that's what happens. She had her own luxury suite of apartments in his house. Oh, she deserves it. She was fed five meals a day. Damn. According to media reports from a golden... <laughs> You're killing that terrier, though. <laughs> according to media re- reports, she was fed from a golden dog bowl. Okay, fair enough. And wore a diamond-studded collar. The only thing I object to is the five meals a day. That's not good for a dog. <laughs> <laughs> um, you wouldn't. You might be looking for one of these, actually. Newberger reportedly had a plaque in his house that he had custom engraved that said, The more I see of men, the more I love my dog. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I have that on, like, a box sign somewhere. Yeah, you got it at Bed Bath or uh, Michael's. Yes, for sure. Now, in 1911, uh, the Great Lafayette and, of course, Beauty were in Edinburgh at the Empire Theater for a sold-out run starting on May 1st. Beauty took ill. No. Yeah. And the Great Lafayette uh, paid for round-the-clock doc, two doctors and a nurse to take round-the-clock care of the dog. Mm-hmm. But... Despite that, she died on May 4th. Sean! Official cause of death was reported as apoplexy by overfeeding and indulgence. Maybe because of the five meals a day. But she was estimated to be maybe as old as 15 also. So, pretty good run, beauty. (sighs) Sean, you didn't tell me this would involve dog death. Well, I thought this story would really touch your heart because Newberger was destroyed by this. Yeah. I could imagine. And he had her embalmed and visited the funeral parlor where she was being held every day. And he even convinced Piers Hill Cemetery to bury the dog. They didn't normally take animals, uh, but they accepted on the condition that he himself would eventually be buried there too when he died. Because they were like, okay, we got a famous guy in here. Mm -hmm. All right, fine. And so despite all of this trauma... This is the, the biggest loss he's ever felt. On May 9th, he was ready to perform again. Hmm. And he went on stage to do his signature illusion, The Lion's Bride. Uh-oh. Now, in The Lion's Bride, like I said, these illusions would have narratives a lot of the time. And in this one, you followed the, the audience would follow the story of a princess who survived a shipwreck, only to be taken into the harem of an evil sultan. Oh. Her lover... Uh, played by the great Lafayette, would ride into the rescue. But the sultan gives the princess a deadly choice. Either be his wife or be fed to a lion. On stage, the princess was then placed in a cage with a live lion, whose head would then be dramatically ripped off to reveal the great Lafayette himself underneath. Oh. All the while, the to, to make things really pop... The stage was filled with fire eaters, jugglers, and costumed performers and dancers. Crusty jugglers. On the night of May 9th, in the midst of all this, a lantern caught the set. Now, the stage door was locked, which was the choice of 
Um, I, I think the magician, a heavy like emergency curtain immediately dropped when the stage caught between the um, stage and the audience. So the audience, so the was, audience was able to get out. Yes. But the stage door was locked and it was very difficult for the people behind the curtain to get out. Newberger actually did escape, but then ran back into the building in order to save his horse. He and ten others burned to death, along with the horse and the lion. Oh, boy. And one last illusionary note here. And while they were preparing his body for cremation, the cleanup was still going on over at the theater two days later, and a second body was found under the stage. Eleventh body, I suppose, technically. It had identical clothes on to the great Lafayette that they were about to embalm. Uh-huh. And the second Lafayette they found was identified as the real Newberger by the diamond rings he was wearing. So the second one was just a body double for the show. A prestige. A prestige. Harry Houdini himself organized a huge funeral. Newberger was cremated, as planned, and ended up being placed... Oh, as not planned, and then planned. And was placed between Beauty's paws in their shared grave. No. Oh. And that's where his story ends. Okay, let's. That's enough of deaths during during magic tricks. I, I'm really shocking and and uh, uh, horrifying you. You look so sad. Well, the dog died, and I can't get over it. I'm sorry. Would talking about Harry Houdini make you feel better? Yeah, a little. Okay. Uh, Harry Houdini did not die during a magic show, but he did die, and we'll get to that later. But first, he was born. He was born in <laughs> well, yeah, 1874, Budapest, Hungary. And at the time, his name was Eric Weiss. Mm -hmm. Eric was the fourth of seven children. His dad was a rabbi, and the family immigrated here in 1878. Here's another guy who found performing early. At uh, the age of just nine, Eric had several jobs, but one of them was as a trapeze artist for, you know, whatever he could get people to throw in his hat. And he went by Eric the Prince of the Air. Ooh, <laughs> Yeah, of course, royal succession being what it is, by 1891, he was going by the king of cards. Oh. But by all accounts, Houdini was competent, but not great at sleight of hand. Hmm. And he started experimenting with other things that maybe he could uh, really differentiate himself with. And he started with escape acts. Mm-hmm. Being tied up and stuff with the, um, what is that? Chinese water torture cell? No. The straight jacket. Straight jacket, yeah. He, he would do handcuff escapes and straight, uh, straight jacket escapes. Um, Houdini was best known for escapes and made millions of dollars doing it from 1899 to 1920 in theaters all over Britain and the U.S. And he was the highest paid performer on vaudeville in that time. He actually stopped using handcuffs at a certain point. Around 1907, he just stopped doing handcuff escapes altogether because everyone else was doing it. Mm. Well, he started the trend. Yeah. And so then he started escaping from a giant milk can that he would have filled with water <laughs> and sealed. Mm-hmm. Um, that later evolved into the, you know, the Chinese water torture cell where he'd be upside down and in a straitjacket, hold his breath for like three minutes and escape. He did that one for the first time in 1912 and kept doing it uh, until his death. He would do big stage illusions too, Houdini. Mm -hmm. uh, he once vanished an elephant in New York. Yeah. On stage. That's, that's no small thing. No, it's a big thing, actually. Houdini was also, especially starting in the 1920s, very well known as a bit of a fraud buster, mm -hmm. as we talked about. In 1922, Scientific American Magazine put him on a committee to investigate paranormal phenomena. Because it was something he liked talking about a lot. Right. And so they offered a $2,500 reward for the first authentic proof of spiritual or paranormal phenomenon. Any visual proof or evidence whatsoever. And there's still stuff like that to this day. I think Scientific American still has this prize available because no one's ever claimed it. Well, they've tried to, I'm sure. They sure have. <laughs> and Houdini was on the first committee for it. So he got to uh, put several of these to the test himself. Um, the first one to try it was a man named George Valiantine, who would give seances. He would also claim aliens were coming a lot, but <laughs> in a controlled test environment, you know, George Valiantine in a seance with Houdini um, moved a trumpet Ooh. that was in the room. And, and the room was dark, but like a, they heard a trumpet move around and, and 
make sounds. <laughs> and some of the participants around the table were like touched on the on the head and shoulders, you know, while everybody was still holding hands. Pretty impressive stuff, right? I mean, how's he doing it? I'm sure I'm about to find out. Yeah, well, Houdini just rigged a light switch to the guy's seat, to Valentine's seat, mm-hmm. so that while the lights were off, observers in the next room could tell every time Valentine left his chair, if he left his chair, while everyone was supposed to be sitting at the table. Uh, and he did, 15 times during the seance, once for as long as 18 seconds. And he wasn't, who was holding the other people's hands? I don't know. Not Valentine. <laughs> Someone under the table or something? Could be. Okay. And so uh, George Valentine failed to collect the prize. Mm. Uh, Mina Crandon was one of the most famous uh, mediums of this era. She went by the professional name Marjorie. (laughs) Ooh, how exotic. She created quite a stir because she would uh, create sounds and people would hear bells ring during her seances um, throughout the house as well as in the room she was in. She also had photos taken, um, you know, flash photography photos of teleplasmic hands, ghostly, um, disgusting meat hands that would, like, appear (laughs) on the table in front of her during a seance. Love a meat hand. Yeah, and so she had lots of big fans, including Harry Houdini's close personal friend, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. The writer of Sherlock Holmes. Yes. Uh, Oh, he was big into spiritualism. Sure was. Arthur Conan Doyle... um, Famously loved the, well, I'll get to that in a second because we'll talk about his fight with Houdini. <laughs> but as for Mina Crandon, uh, Houdini had a seance with this lady where he, he just made her wear a contraption on her legs that kept her from moving them. Because the suspicion was that this woman was just freeing her legs up during the seance and ringing bells and moving things uh, with her toes. And her feet were terrible, so those were the meat hands, right? <laughs> Uh, the meat hand was, I'm not even sure how this worked, but the meat hand was um, studied at some point and uh, it turned out to be like made of liver. So, Meat hand. She would definitely just flop out of a little thing of liver. Ugh. Like from under her skirt or something? Yeah. Yuck. It's like, it seems to, when you look at the picture, it's like it's coming out of her crotch, actually. It's weird. She's cute, but she always smells like liver. <laughs> um. So they did still hear audio effects when the lights were out and this woman had this box around her legs. Mm -hmm. Uh, But when the lights came back on, it turned out the lid of the box had been forced open. (laughs) Oh, boy. So Marjorie went out to people and said loudly and publicly that Houdini and Scientific American had cheated by wrenching the top off the box themselves so that they could claim she had cheated. In response, Houdini started doing Crandon's act as part of his stage act. (laughs) I can ring bells with my toes, too. He would. He would. He'd like, he Look would at my meat hand. Like in the middle of his magic show, he'd go, I want to take a few minutes to talk about Mina Crandon. And he would just do her act. <laughs> He's the king of petty, yeah, for sure. hundred percent. There was another guy named Joaquin Argamazia. Mm. Also known as the Spaniard with the x-ray eyes. Oh. He was, of course, from Spain. Well, not of course. I That's mean, we we talked about Chung Ling Su. True. He did, of course, have x-ray eyes. <laughs> um, Joaquin could read notes or the numbers on dice through closed metal boxes. Hmm. Houdini debunked this one pretty easily. The guy was wearing a thin blindfold and had, uh, Houdini said, there must be a way he can, re- he's boxes rigged so he can peek into it. Okay. Joaquin Argamasia always denied this, but when he was given another metal box to do the trick with, or any other material, he couldn't do it with any box he didn't own. So Listen, he's a little shy, okay? He's shy in public. He has to do it with his own box. Houdini gathered all of this stuff into a book that he called A Magician Among the Spirits. And he chronicled his ghost-busting adventures, including numerous seances he had attended in disguise, uh, along with a cop and a reporter, because Houdini was too famous to um, do not go incognito. Mm-hmm. Conan Doyle was not a big fan of this book. And they stopped being friends after Houdini published it. Because Conan Doyle was such a believer. Yeah. A few years before, there had been the fairy pictures. <laughs> yeah. What year were the fairy pictures? Early 1900s, right? Um, in 1917, the Cottingley fairy photos were just these obvious fakes made by some children who literally took 
photos of paper dolls in there. Well, they looked pretty pretty good for the time just because there were actual items in the picture that were standing in for these fairies, but that's just because they were paper dolls. But when you look at them, they're like so clearly illustrated. Oh, yeah. Uh, Sean, you don't know what a fairy's going to look like. So Arthur Conan Doyle saw these and little girls, three young sisters, put these photos out there. And they didn't admit that it was a hoax. I get so excited about this story. And they didn't admit that it was a <laughs> you hoax. You love fairies. And they didn't admit that it was a hoax until they were old women. So Arthur Conan Doyle was full in on these girls in 1917, these fairies. Okay, photos. don't, let's not say that. My point is, Houdini, <laughs> they, they started having a fallout, a, they started having a falling out then, because Houdini was like, dude, the fairy photos are, come on. Come on. Right. Arthur, come on. Arthur, come on. It's like having a friend who's really getting into um, a multi-level marketing Yeah, or thing. a cult, right? <laughs> or Scientology, and it's like, dude. It's like, well, I, I, you got to do what you, you're going to do, but... I'm not going to be a part of it. This? Right. And he, uh, I'm sure because he was associated with being the ghost buster, the fraud buster, he didn't want to be associated with this kind of bullshit. Exactly. Exactly. Well, in 1931, Arthur Conan Doyle actually wrote a rebuttal book <gasps> to A Magician Among the Spirits. A spirit among the magicians. No, it was called Edge of the Unknown. Um, published in 1931. Not a Tom Cruise movie? <laughs> yeah, Live Die, Edge of the Unknown. Live Die, Repeat. Yeah, spooky. In 1931, Edge of the Unknown, in which Conan Doyle claimed that Houdini is not only a liar, but also a powerful psychic medium who debunks the powers of other mediums in order to remove his rivals from the board. Oh, twist upon a twist. Yeah, you see, he can pretend to disprove these other things because he can use his powers to block these other mediums' powers because he's such a powerful medium. Well, you're only increasing his aura, Arthur Conan Doyle. You're only making him cooler and more mysterious. It's like, no, no, it's not. You're, you're a wizard. <laughs> Like, all right, thanks. Mm, you're lying, liar. I bet you're a wizard. <laughs> okay, dude. You'd like that, wouldn't you? But after he printed A Magician Among the Spirits, he contacted a little gentleman named H.P. Lovecraft. Here's another horror connection for us. Wow. And Houdini paid Lovecraft to ghostwrite a horror story for him, uh, Imprisoned with the Pharaohs, which you can uh, read, you know, you can read it on the internet. It was published in Weird Tales magazine at the time. Wow, I didn't know that. Oh, you should uh, read it. I mean, it's a Lovecraft story. Just That's not what Masks of Nirlothotep is based on, is it? I One... probably butchered that name. Masks of Nirlothotep is um, like a year and a half long uh, campaign for the role-playing game Call of Cthulhu. Uh, w One scenario in that game is based on this Harry Houdini story. Cool. Which Houdini didn't write. Well. Oh. Anyway, he liked what Lovecraft did with that story, which isn't very good, uh, except for the ending, which is cool. And so in 1926, Houdini hired Lovecraft again, along with his buddy C.M. Eddy, to write a book called The Cancer of Superstition, in which the three men would lay out all of their beliefs about how religion, uh, superstition, and other just, you know, any supernatural belief was basically the root of all evil. So they were like the ghost-busting supergroup of the era. Yes, yeah. Very much so. But that book was never um, published. Because in 1926, Harry Houdini also died. <sighs> he was uh, doing a run of performances at the Princess Theater in uh, Montreal. And on October 22nd, before his show, he was hanging out in his dressing room when a couple of McGill University students came in and they were chatting him up. And a boy named Jocelyn Whitehead. Jocelyn. A boy named Jocelyn Whitehead. A boy named Jocelyn reportedly said, uh, there's a couple different accounts of this story, but, but uh, more or less it went like this. Whitehead said, uh, hey, is it true punches in the stomach don't hurt you? And was, that a, was that a thing? But 
Yes, yeah, uh, famous. It was actually it, it was a totally a th- it was a thing that Houdini would do on stage. He would say, "Any man in this audience can come up on stage and pummel me in the stomach, and it, I won't wince." So it was like a a punch catch trick. Yes, although that wasn't really a trick. He just had these incredibly hardened, trained ab muscles that he could tighten and just kind of take anything to the belly. Hmm. But not my face. He could also really hold his breath for three minutes. You know, he he was an impressive. Sure, yeah. You, I mean, you have to be able to do that sort of thing. And so Houdini, who was sitting on a couch at the time because he had just broken his ankle in the prior performance, Oop. said, uh, well, I don't know. My stomach can endure a lot. Oh! As the man delivered several hammer-like abdomen blows. Houdini actually reached out and stopped his arm mid-blow on the like fourth or fifth one and said, okay, thank you. I've had enough. Oh, no. He, um... What's the word? Sucker punched him. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, he didn't have time to, to get it ready. What a dick. Houdini was in immense pain. Eye-watering, vision-blurring pain. Uh, but he did his show that night. And because Houdini was a man, he didn't go to the doctor. Till two days later when the pain was absolutely unbearable. Mm. And the doctor said, oh, you, sir, have <laughs> acute appendicitis. And you need to have surgery actually right now. Like actually yesterday would have been better, but now we can we can do it right now. So did the punch burst his appendix or was the appendix already messed up? A word on that in a moment. Okay. The surgery likely would have saved Houdini's life. He declined it because he had a show to get to. Ugh, Harry. You're you're not going to have any shows to get to anymore if you don't get your surgery. So he went back for that October 29th performance (sighs) where he he passed out mid-performance on stage, was revived, finished the show, (sighs) and then after curtain closed, uh, he had to be rushed back to the hospital and finally died of acute peritonitis and a ruptured appendix. Oh yeah, he died on Halloween. Yes, that's right. October 31st with his wife, Bess by his side. Uh, They don't know if the punch ruptured his appendix. It could be, though, that his appendix was already ruptured and he would have noticed it if he hadn't taken the punches to the belly and thought the pain was just from that. Are there any conspiracy theories about his death? Like he was killed by big Ouija board or something? Yeah, you would think so. That theory has been advanced in two books that I can find. Um, The Man Who Killed Houdini from 2005 by Don Bell and The Secret Life of Houdini by William Kalish and Larry Sloman, 2006. So this is a really popular early 2000s theory. Yeah, I guess. And the idea is that like spiritualists could have a secret spiritualist cabal could have poisoned Houdini uh, and that actually caused the ruptured appendix. But I don't know of any poisons that specifically cause a ruptured appendix. You think on that one for a moment. You you love poison. <laughs> or the idea that Well that that sounds that sounds bad, Sean. Hey, when my bloated corpse is found, I think your reading history and your Google search history are going to be interesting. <laughs> well it doesn't have to be bloated. Well no, depending on the poison, I suppose. <laughs> but that doesn't sound like a poison to me. But I don't really know anything about um poisons. It, it, there's also the possibility that someone paid Jocelyn Whitehead to punch Houdini in the stomach for murder? For murder? Purposes? That uh, doesn't seem... Listen, it's... this guy this guy is real good at, at getting punched. He never gets hurt. I want you to punch him to kill him. What? He lingered for nine days afterward. Like, it's a very bad method of murder, if that's what it was. It's also like, so you're going to kill him in the way that you know... He is very good at defending. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's only because they caught him off guard that it did any damage. Right. So, yeah, a little silly. I think it's just a tragic accident. Mm-hmm. But nonetheless, Bess burned a candle at home next to a picture of Harry Houdini 24 hours a day for 10 years. And she would, as I'm sure you know, Carrie, hold yearly seances on the anniversary of Houdini's death. Which happened to be Halloween. Which happened to be Halloween night. Now, in these seances, which she conducted with different mediums, no matter who the medium was, no matter what year, Bess was always looking to hear one particular phrase. 
Now, you see, before Houdini had died, he and Bess had agreed, because she had a little bit more of a tendency to believe in this kind of thing than Houdini did. Houdini agreed with uh, Bess that if he went first, she would conduct seances to try to contact him, and she would know it was really him. She would know that this thing was legit if she heard the phrase, Rosabelle Believe. Now, this is because uh, Rosabelle was the name of their favorite song. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, interestingly, in 1929, on just the third seance, Bess was conducting one of these seances with medium Arthur Ford when Ford gave that message. He said, Rosabelle, believe. He says, Rosabelle, believe. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. I feel like there's a trick coming. Um, Well, this journalist Harold Kellick did write a book in 1928, a year before that seance, called Houdini, His Life Story. And he interviewed Bess a lot for the book and she told him that and it's in that book printed a year before so it wasn't that secret a code phrase come on Bess (laughs) it kind of defeats the purpose yeah you you tell people the secret phrase Bess yeah so if I carry the secret phrase that I've already given you to search for after my death Mm -hmm. no one can ever know and they never will the secret dies with me Mm -hmm. and then dies again with you oh Is that a threat? No. No, I'll be gone. (laughs) The last Houdini seance was held in 1936, Halloween night, of course, on the roof of the Knickerbocker Hotel. Ah, one of the uh, haunted locales in haunted Hollywood. That's right. And it was after that 10th seance that Bess was finally able to put the candle out next to her picture of Houdini. She reportedly said, well, 10 years is long enough to wait for any man. That's fair. (laughs) It is. <laughs> and she'd never been contacted by uh, by Harry. Not not no. unless that first one. She screwed it up. She screwed up the whole test case. <laughs> All right. Uh, Harry, if you can hear me, we got to change the phrase. <laughs> yeah. Kind of kind of bungled that one. Okay. So now say, let me think, let me think, let me think, let me think. So that's the life and times of Harry Houdini. I wanted to end it there. He's the most famous of these magicians that we talked about today, but he's also the one who kind of hooks this full story all back into the rest of what we talk about on this podcast. Mm -hmm. So often what we're talking about so far and what we will be talking about on this podcast is who's lying, who's telling the truth, and how are they getting away with it? Harry Houdini is a guy who just wanted to know how they were getting away with it. Till the bitter end. And then after that, kind of. Want to treat your pup to something special? When you visit www.barkbox.com slash ain't it scary, you can receive a free month added to your plan when you sign up for a six or 12 month subscription. That's an extra month of two fun toys, two full size bags of treats, and a tasty chew at no additional cost. Recent box themes have included Home Alone, Liquor Treat, and A Night at the Squeakeasy. Poe loves trying out new toys and treats, and he was psyched to get a Bark Box. Your pup will be too. So sign up at www.barkbox.com slash ain't it scary for a free month added to any six or 12 month subscription. That's barkbox.com slash A-I-N-T-I-T-S-C-A-R-Y. Give your furry friends something to bark about. Bark Box. Carry purchased. Poe approved. Let's take a trip to the Bazaar Bazaar. Ooh. A team of researchers studying the famed Nazca lines in Peru believe that they have solved the mystery of why the drawings were created. Sadly for us, it doesn't involve aliens. It wasn't like a roadmap or a cookbook. Oh, God, it's a cookbook! <laughs> The potential breakthrough was announced in a press release from a group known as Salvar Nazca, which has been studying the designs over the last eight years. This group of archaeologists, engineers, and historians have declared that they have made one of the greatest discoveries in the world of archaeology at an international level. Wow! Salvar Nazca says that the Nazca lines were not drawings meant to be seen by visitors coming to our planet from another world, as some have theorized, 
but are actually a complex system of channels for the irrigation of vast extensions of the desert, a pre-Inca technique already known as water harvesting. Boring! Well, Sean, this arrangement, they argue, had the objective of controlling it and taking advantage of it in the different seasons of the year in the face of such changing humidity conditions in that region. Why exactly this irrigation system consisted of different shapes and animal depictions goes unanswered in this announcement. But since they present their findings officially to the International Congress of Cultural Tourism in Cordoba later this month, hopefully there will be an explanation. Engineer and Salvador Nazca leader Carlos Hermida reassured us that their solution to the mystery will be bolstered by numerous and conclusive proofs, and that the discovery of the irrigation system could ultimately save millions of lives around the world. Well, we'll see what he means by that after the presentation in Cordoba. Is it like better than modern irrigation systems? Uh, I assume that's what he means, but I think he's he's saving it for the big, the big to do. All right, man, save your juice. Um, well, that's kind of cool. So maybe we'll have a great way, new way to water our um, backyard. Yeah, we'll just carve some eagles into it and uh, harvest that water. Well, I've already been doing that. Oh. But now there's a use for all the eagle carvings. <laughs> At least there's that. That's it for this episode of Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Ain't It Scary and check out our website at ain'titscary.com. You can support the show by supporting our sponsors and becoming a patron at www.patreon.com slash ain'titscary. And please subscribe to the show and throw us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We'll be forever grateful. Yes, and special thanks to our Tier 3 patrons, Nate Curtis, Sean O'Donnell, Jared Chamberlain, and Maria Ferrante. We are eternally grateful. Wait, you just said that. Mm-hmm. Yep, and special thanks to our Tier 3 patrons, Nate Curtis, Sean O'Donnell, Jared Chamberlain, and Maria Ferrante. They are enjoying all kinds of cool perks, including getting to hear their names right here. And we love them very much. Very, very much. See you next Thursday. Show created by Sean and Carrie McCabe. Music by Kyle Ryan. This has been a production of Longboy Media. Wow.